Paul is writing in the book of Philippians is writing about joy and what joy means. And so I hope that uh, over these next few weeks, as we begin talking about joy, it's my prayer that each of us would be able to experience God's joy in all of our lives. And so that's what I'm hoping uh, that we glean from this. But I think in order for us to experience God's joy in our life, we have to be aware of the different places in our life that God wants to give us joy. It's not just a matter of saying, God, I want joy, which is a first step. We have to be aware of where is it that God's true joy wants to be evident in all of our lives. When you hear the word joy, what is it that you first think of? What is that thought that comes to your mind that just uh, sticks in your mind that just makes you think, oh, that is what I think of when I hear the word joy. This morning I want to talk about one thing that joy isn't, and then I want to talk about several things that joy is and look at how that impacts our life. One thing I think the world wants to tell us that joy is, it's that bubbly, outgoing personality. And a lot of us think that, ooh, if you see somebody that has that bubbly, outgoing personality, that person has joy in their life. That person is just beaming with joy. But that is not joy. This uh, idea of joy being some type of personality is totally foreign and not found in God's Word. You can be joyous and be an introvert. You can be joyous and be an extrovert. Joy has absolutely nothing to do with your personality. Joy can only be found in your heart. That's where you find God's joy, and that's what we're going to focus on. Last week, we started by looking at a scripture in John chapter 15, verse 11. I just want to read that to you this morning before we start. We are going to read in Philippians here in just a minute. But I want to read this, John 15, 11 to you. These are Jesus' words. He said, I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy that I have and so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy, or some of your translation, translations may say, so that your joy will be complete. One thing that I think that we have to start with as we start talking about joy is we have to have the understanding that joy is in our heart, but that joy is also something that is normal for Christians. Joy isn't something abnormal. Joy isn't something that we want to have. Joy is something that you find when someone is walking in their relationship with God. Joy is normal. Joy should be something that we experience every single day of our life. We wake up with joy. We go to bed with joy. It's not waking up in the morning and your feet hit the ground and you start saying zippity doo dah, what a wonderful... That's not joy. That is an emotion. And we're going to distinguish between these two as we go through the next several weeks. But this morning, as we start talking about joy, I want you to stick a spiritual thermometer in your mouth for just a minute. So pretend that in the chair next to you is a spiritual thermometer. And pretend that you stick it in your mouth. Or some of you, if you want to really stick it in your mouth, that's fine. Um, and you pull that thermometer out. On that thermometer, it should register joy. If your thermometer does not register joy, then there is a short somewhere in your Christian walk. And I hope that you seek that joy that God wants to give you over these next several weeks. And that in your time of prayer, which with you and God, you are praying that the joy of the Lord would be your strength. One thing we are going to do over these next several weeks is we're going to dig into the Word of God because I believe that joy can be found deep in God's Word. And if you are seeking joy, you will find and be able to experience God's joy. Philippians is often described as the book of joy. 
And so as we study Philippians, it's been my prayer that on your spiritual thermometer, that it would register more and more joy or that the joy quotient in your life would just be filled, filled, filled more and more until it comes to a point of where it's overflowing. One scripture I shared with you last week, if you take notes, I want you to write this down. It's Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. I believe that as we talk about joy, as we study joy, and as we pray for more and more of God's joy, what is Satan going to do? He's going to attack the joy level in all of our lives. And so when the attack of Satan comes, I want you to be able to go back to Satan with Scripture. Whenever Jesus was confronted with, with Satan and he was tempted three times, what did Jesus do? He always went back to Scripture. And so I hope that this will be one of those verses that you go back to over and over. Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. Nehemiah eight ten. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Something that joy isn't. Joy isn't a switch. A lot of us think that we can flip joy on and we can switch joy off. It's just this switch. You can flip it on and you can turn it off. It, that, that's not joy. Joy isn't something that can be there and then be gone. If joy is there and then joy is gone, then what you're relying on more than likely is an emotion inside of you. And it is not a constant joy that God wants to give all of us. And in order for us to understand joy, we have to understand that the joy that God wants to give to us is a process. We're going to look at that process. We're going to look at how uh, Paul, in writing to the church in Philippi, lays out this process for joy as he is writing this book while chained in a dungeon, in a, in a prison that he had back in his time. Some people think that if you have joy, you have no, you have no problems. And oh, how I wish that was the case. I wish that in order to have joy in our lives, and if we had joy, when we had no problems, we know that that's not the case. Jesus told his disciples they were going to have problems. We know that problems are going to come in our lives. And as we start talking about joy, probably what's going to happen is Satan will confront us with problems in all of our lives. And so we have to be aware that that is a natural spiritual battle that is being waged in every single one of our lives. So how do we find joy? Where do we dig into the scripture and find joy? I believe that it starts in Paul's letter to the Philippians in verse 1. If you take a look at verse 1 with me, let's read verse, verse 1 and 2 this morning. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul doesn't use the word joy there, but I think if we read between the lines, we can see that as Paul was getting ready to tell this church about joy, we can see how he is laying that foundation right there at the very, very beginning. I think that the beginning to joy in all of our lives the beginning to having God's joy in every one of our lives starts with how you see yourself. And what Paul is writing in this introduction, in this greeting in his letter to the church, he is telling them how he sees himself. He's just laying it out there. He said, this is Paul and Timothy. We're writing this letter to you. And what words did he use? He said that we are that we are servants of Jesus Christ. That's how Paul starts. So Paul is saying, I'm getting ready to tell you about joy. But before I tell you about joy, I want to tell you about myself. And he says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. The literal word there is slave. Now, when we think of a slave, we often don't think a lot about joy. But what Paul is saying to the church is, I have chosen to be a servant of Jesus Christ. I have chosen to be a slave of Jesus Christ. I am a willing slave to Jesus. And so if you want to find real joy in your life, if you want to experience the joy that Jesus prayed for his disciples, the joy that Jesus prayed for every single one of us, you have to choose to be a servant of Jesus Christ. 
And until you make that choice, you will never, ever experience true joy in your life. We often worry about other people and why they don't have joy in their lives. If they have not chosen to, to serve Jesus Christ, to be a slave of Jesus Christ, then they will never, ever find real joy. Now, servants don't demand their own way. A servant never walks up to the master and says, today, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and that is it. And what you think doesn't matter to me. That doesn't work when you are a servant talking to your master. If you are a servant, you wait to receive orders from your master. And then you go about executing those plans. Otherwise, you run the risk of being executed yourself. And so if you want to find joy, your foundation for joy has to be being a servant, being a slave of Jesus Christ. And the only way that you will experience joy and then see an increase in joy in your life is if you are a servant of Jesus Christ. And then after Paul addresses how he views himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, then he goes on to talk about what I want to talk about this morning, about relationships. We can find joy in our relationships. And Paul, in the beginning of the letter, uh, in the beginning of the book of Philippians, his letter to the church of Philippi talks about relationships and how relationships will bring us joy. There are three ways that I found in the beginning of chapter one in the book of Philippians. In relationships, Paul talks about of how we can find joy. I want to tell you those three ways and then I want to talk about those three ways. Paul says in our relationships, if we keep people in our thoughts, we'll experience joy. The next one, he says, if we keep people in our hearts, we will experience joy. And the third one is if we pray for people that God places in our lives, then we will experience joy. Let's talk about the first one. We will experience joy if we keep people in our thoughts. Take a look at verse 3. Paul goes on to say, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have, care for, I have caring thoughts for people. Paul said, I am keeping you in my thoughts. He said, here's who I am. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I am a slave to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then immediately after that, in writing this letter of joy to the church, Paul said, I am keeping you in my thoughts. So Paul, in laying this foundation, in building this framework of what joy is in the Christian's life, Paul said, if you want to have joy in your life, if you want to experience God's real joy, then you have to keep people in your thoughts. He said, I remember you. And then he went on to talk about how he remembers those people that he keeps in his thoughts. It wasn't an out of sight, out of mind thing. You're not here and so I'm not going to think about you. Paul said, I remember you. I keep you in my thoughts. He goes on and on and on. Paul didn't pretend that there were no problems in this church. Paul didn't just think about the people in his life that, that didn't bring problems into his life. Because Paul eventually goes on to address some of the problems in the church in Philippi. But what Paul said is whether you have problems or whether you don't have problems, no matter what your circumstances are, I'm keeping you in my thoughts. When was the last time that you thanked God for somebody that he brought into your life. I'm not talking about the husband and wife. I'm not talking about just your parents or maybe grandparents or your best friends. I'm talking about people that are in the peripheral of your life that God has intentionally placed there for you to give thanks for them. Paul said in Philippians 3 through 6, or uh, verses 3 through 6, 
I'm keeping you in my thoughts, and then I give thanks for you. I'm not talking about the people in your life that have no drama. Paul says, I give thanks for all of you. That includes people that talk about you behind your back. That includes people whose sole intention in their relationship with you is to stab you in the back. Paul said, I give thanks for all of you. I'm keeping you in my thoughts. And not only am I keeping you in my thoughts, he said, I am going to remember you before the Lord. In my time with God, I'm going to remember you. I believe that it's not a coincidence that the first thing Paul tells us in this letter of joy to the church is that if we want to experience joy in our life, we have to keep people in our thoughts and remember them in our time with God. When was the last time that you thanked somebody in your time with God that made fun of you, that called you names, who lied about you to your boss? When was the last time you did that? Because Paul said, I'm doing that for all the church in Philippi. Every single one. If you want to experience joy, if you want to experience God's real joy, you have to keep people in your thoughts and remember them when you go to God in prayer. And in these verses, at the beginning of this book, Paul says, I'm, I keep you in my thoughts. And then he says, I remember you in my prayers. I remember all of you in my prayers. And then in verse 6, he says, the reason that I do this is that I'm confident of this, that he, Jesus, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was expressing his confidence in Jesus Christ. You see, what Paul knew was that everybody God had placed in his life, everybody God placed in his life for a specific reason. I believe that's true for every one of us. There is no one in our life that God did not place there. God has placed everybody in your life for a reason. And that reason is so you can remember them and so you can pray for them. The good people and the bad people. The people that intend to do good to you and the people that intend to harm you. God's placed them in your lives so you can remember them and so you can pray for them. So that you can experience God's joy. Well, how's that possible? Paul said, my confidence is in Jesus Christ. It was verse 6. We read it right there. Paul said, I'm not placing my confidence in my relationship with them. I'm not placing confidence in that individual person. Paul said, I'm placing my confidence in Jesus Christ. That he who began a good work in them will be able to complete it until the day of the Lord. You see, what we do naturally is we want to place our confidence in our relationships. We want to place our confidence in who we are. Or our confidence in who that individual is. But Paul said if you want to experience joy in your relationship with those people. You have to place the confidence that you have in Jesus Christ. The confidence in He that began a good work will be able to complete it. If your confidence is on yourself. If your confidence is on somebody else. Then you have misguided direction in your life. And because of that, you won't be able to experience the joy of the Lord the way that God wants you to experience. And so if you want to experience God's joy, the first step to doing that is to keep people in your thoughts. Every single one of us have a requirement of God to keep people in our thoughts and then remember them when we go to the Lord. Joy is impossible, I believe, if you don't remember people, if you don't keep people in your thoughts. The next, how do you experience God's joy? To experience God's joy, Paul said, after he said, I'm keeping you in my thoughts, the next step he said, I'm going to keep you in my heart. I'm going to keep you in my heart. Look at verse 7 
And look at verse 8. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, for whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. There are two words that Paul used here that stick out to me. He said, I have you all in my heart. I got you in my thoughts. And I remember you when I go to the Lord. But next he said, I've got you in my heart. Those two words that stick out to me that Paul wrote in those two verses there. One is partnership. And the other is fellowship. And I want to talk about how Paul used those two words for just a minute there. Paul said, we are partners in sharing the good news. Now, I know that there are people in your life that you are not a partner with in sharing the good news with. The reason I believe God put them in your life is that so you can find a partner to share the good news with them so that eventually they will become a partner in sharing the good news. Because those people that aren't a partner in sharing the good news will not have joy in their life. And when you focus on a partnership in sharing God's grace, the focus is not on the partnership, not on the relationship that you have with somebody, but then the focus becomes on the grace of Jesus Christ. Each of us are partners in sharing the grace of Christ. Every one of us. And if we are focusing on our relationship with each other, then we're not going to be able to experience joy. Our focus in our partnership has to be on the grace of Jesus Christ. And if we put our hope of joy in anything else, then we're going to, at the end of the day, wind up joyless. You see, if we focus together in our partnership on the grace of Jesus Christ, then a lot of this peripheral stuff that earth wants to give to us, that we sometimes want to focus on in the church, it doesn't matter. If we're focusing on the grace of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter when we come in a church, if we're sitting on chairs or if we're sitting in pews. If we're focusing in our partnership together on the grace of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter when we come in here if the carpet is a pink neon color or if the carpet is an appropriate fitting color. Because the carpet doesn't matter. What matters is the grace of Jesus Christ. And Paul said the way that we are going to build this framework for joy in our lives is by focusing not on all of the junk that Satan wants us to focus on, not focusing on our partnership together, but Paul said we are going to focus on the grace of Jesus Christ. And if we focus on anything else, we will never be able to experience real joy in our lives. Our focus for joy should be upon our partnership in the grace of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, that's what we're focusing on. Paul said, it's right for me to feel this way about you. He said, I have you in my heart. Because if I'm in chains, or I'm defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Christ. Then the next thing that Paul said, two words there, partnership and the next, he talked about fellowship. Now fellowship isn't friendship. A lot of times we want to focus on our friendship with those relationships that we have in our life. But fellowship is much stronger than a simple friendship. Fellowship in Christ is so much more. Friendship says, I like you. But fellowship, Paul said, is that I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. You see, that is so much more 
than a friendship of I like you. That is so much more than we are friends and we have some common interests and we share in that together. Paul said, I have an affection for every one of you in Jesus Christ. The literal meaning of that word affection, the literal meaning there is bowels. So think about that. You go home, you call somebody you know, and you say, my bowels long for you. That's the literal meaning of the word. They're probably going to hang up with you and never talk to you ever, 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 ever again. But that's the literal meaning of the word there. And what is Paul trying to say? He's not telling the, the church in Philippi, my bowels are longing for you. The way that they used the Greek word back then was, it's so much more than just my heart longs for you. We've said that. My heart longs for you. What Paul was saying is, my entire being has an affection for you. It's so much more than just one organ in my body. I'm including absolutely everything inside of me. And that, all of my being, Paul says, has an affection for you. All of me, every single bit of me, I love you so much that just this one organ isn't enough. I love you with all of me. And what Paul is saying is, Every bit of my being, every ounce of who that I am, all of me, every single bit has an affection for you through Jesus Christ. I will long for you, he said, with the affection of Jesus Christ. Now, we've often said and, and talked about in our circles and, and, and thought about how much God loves us. We can quote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we talk about the love of God. We hear about the love of God. But what Paul is saying here is he wants us to think that God has so much more than just a love for us. What Paul is describing is that God has an affection for us with every single ounce of who he is. God longs for us. And Paul says, in order to experience joy in your life, we have to have a longing for people in our lives, in fellowship with each other. Paul says, that's where you find joy. How do we know that was the case? Because at the beginning of time, God created Adam. And in that time, God said, Adam is lonely. And so what did God do? God created Eve for Adam so that they could be together. You see, Adam had a longing inside of him that could only be fulfilled in a relationship that God created for Adam. And Paul is saying to the church in Philippians or in, in Philippi, there is a longing that is inside of you that can only be fulfilled in relationships and in that fulfilling relationship you can find joy Paul said my affection for you is based upon Jesus Christ that deep affection can lead us to joy so we find joy when we keep people in our thoughts we find joy when we keep people in our hearts and the last thing Paul said here in the beginning of the book of Philippians is we can find joy when we keep people in our prayers. You want to add more joy to your life? Paul said, pray for other people. You want to have a little bit, uh, a little bit more joy? You want your joy quotient to go up in your life? So then you've got to pray for people. Take a look at verse 9. Paul said, and this is my prayer. He talked about how he keeps them in their thoughts. He remembers them. And then he said, I am keeping you in my heart. And then here in verse 9, Paul says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. 
Paul said, I am praying for you so that you become more and more like Jesus Christ. So again, I want to ask you this morning, when was the last time you prayed for somebody that God placed in your life? That they would become more and more like Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you want somebody to say that prayer about you? That you become more and more like Jesus Christ? Paul said, this is my prayer. I want you to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And then in verse 10, Paul goes on to say, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm praying for you. Keeping you in my heart. I'm keeping you in my thoughts. But I'm keeping you in my prayers. You know the best thing that you can do for anybody? The absolute best thing you can do for anybody is to pray for them. And Paul said, I'm keeping you in my prayers. I'm praying for every one of you. And then he said, I'm praying for you to make the right choices. I'm praying for you to make Jesus choices, if you will. You know, so, so many times in our lives, we're worried about other people. We're worried about the choices that, we're, that they're making. We're worried, especially if, if, if you're a parent, you're worried about what your, the decisions that your kids are making. You're worried about the decisions your best friend is making. You're worried about the decisions that your boss is making at work. You're worried about the decisions your neighbor is making. And what Paul is saying is, don't worry about that stuff. What you need to do is you need to be praying for the decisions that those people are making. Praying that they make godly choices. And then he said, pray for their spiritual growth. Paul said, I'm praying for this. I'm praying for you for this. It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. I'm praying for your choices. And then he says, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. So who's God bringing to your mind this morning that you need to pray for? In your relationships, a parent, a child, a boss, another family member, somebody you work with, your neighbor, some of your friends, an acquaintance, somebody that you interact with only occasionally. Who is God telling you this morning that you need to pray for? You need to stop worrying about them. You need to stop thinking about the decisions that they're making. You need to forget about all of their stuff in their life and just start praying for them. Because if we're spending our time worrying about them, then that is time that we could spend focusing on the joy level that we have in our life. And Paul said, if you want to experience this joy, this is what I am doing in my life. I'm keeping you in my heart, I'm keeping you in my thoughts, and I'm keeping you in my prayers. And then we're going to see go on to talk about the joy of the Lord. But Paul says, this is what I'm doing. In my relationship with you, I'm keeping you in my heart, I'm keeping you in my thoughts, I'm keeping you in my prayers. And I am praying for you not to settle for something less than what is blameless and what is pure in your walk with God. Again, I want to tell you that I firmly believe, wholeheartedly, 100% believe, that God has placed people in your lives for a specific reason. And I believe it's so that you can keep them in your heart, so you can keep them in your thoughts, and so you can keep them in your prayers. Remembering that we are servants, that we are slaves of our Master, Jesus Christ. And if we start by doing these things, then and only then will we see God's joy level go up in all of our lives. So this morning, what relationship do you have that needs to be fixed? That you need to start by keeping somebody in your heart. You need to start by keeping somebody in your thoughts. You need to start by putting them in your prayers. What relationship do you have that you need to share the grace of Jesus Christ and live and walk in the grace of Jesus Christ in those relationships? 
We pray for joy. We talk about joy. We ask God to give us more joy in our life. But the only way we can do that is if we let God fix our relationships. And some of us in here this morning may have had such a bad experience in relationships that we put up this wall around us and we dare not let anybody attempt to come inside of that wall. There's a door that's locked and nobody's coming inside of that. Because at some point in some time, maybe a lot of times, some of your relationships, you've been the one on the end of that has been burned. You've been the one on the end of that has been hurt over and over and over again. Maybe those are some relationships that you've focused on the wrong things. That you've put your hope not in the grace of Jesus Christ, not in the strength of His fellowship, but you put your hope in the strength of that relationship. And then when that relationship couldn't stand the test of time, then you lost hope. And the joy that God wants to give you never came into your life. The greatest relationship healer of all time is Jesus Christ. And if we want to experience Jesus' joy, then we have to start by letting God take control of all of our relationships. Every single one of our relationships. And then move to the next step keeping people in our hearts, keeping people in our thoughts, and keeping people in our prayers. This morning, God may have said to you, I need to come into your life and I need to heal some areas that you might not want to let him into. Maybe you've built a wall around you because of bad relationships that you're not even willing to let Jesus inside of that wall. Maybe there's some healing that we need to experience in the depths of our soul before we ever start thinking about experiencing God's joy. If that's the case this morning, I want to ask you, when we stand and we sing here in just a minute, to ask God's healing hand come upon your life and to heal all of the hurts and to heal all of the brokenness and all of the destruction that you've kept inside so that in going forward we will be able to discover the real joy of God and what God really means and what Paul is really saying keeping people in our hearts keeping people in our thoughts and keeping people in our prayers Sometimes, I think some of us just don't have any strength, strength to go forward. Sometimes you have to muster up every bit of courage and every bit of strength that you have inside of you just to put one foot in front of the other. And if that's how you're living your life, then you're not living the life the way that Paul is talking about joy in the book of Philippians. And you're not living your life the way that Jesus shared with his disciples about their joy in John chapter 15. And you're definitely not living your life the way that Nehemiah says we should be living our life in Nehemiah chapter 8. With the joy of the Lord being our strength. This morning, how are you living your life? Where are you getting your strength? Is the joy of the Lord your strength? Or are you putting your hope? Are you putting your foundation? Are you drawing from some other well than the joy of the Lord? This morning, I want to encourage you to find your strength only, only in the joy of the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we come to you and we just ask today that you would begin to speak to every single one of us 
about where we find our joy from. That you would challenge us to find our real joy of you. Lord, I pray that today, as we leave from here in just a few minutes, that we could truly say the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's nothing less and nothing more. It's, it's not the strength of my relationships. It's not how I feel when I wake up in the morning. It's not what you've placed around me. But our joy is in you and you alone. And God, I just pray this morning that as we pray, for those who may have been injured by relationships, that you would just come into each of their lives and this morning that you would just begin healing those areas that needed to be healed that your grace would just flow abundantly in this place covering all of those injuries covering all of those spots and tearing down those walls that we sometimes want to build around us so that we can find and experience your joy in our lives not an emotion, not something we manufacture, not how we feel, but your true joy in our lives. God, in this time that we have left together here today, I just pray and ask that you would speak to every single one of us. We all have relationships in our lives that we need to learn how to keep people in our hearts and our thoughts and in our prayers. And I pray, God, that you would just begin to bring people to our mind that we need to pray for. That you would just show us faces of people, even right now, Lord, that this morning we would just pray for them. Maybe it is our boss or a neighbor or somebody that we work with that just aggravates us to no end. Or somebody that's in our life that we just, we just can't seem to want to pray for them. I just pray, God, that right now you would just teach us to pray for them so that we'll be able to experience your joy. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your joy. Thank you, Lord, for speaking and convicting each of us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing and as we close our service this morning, I want to challenge you to let God speak to you. It's not my words that's going to change you. It's not what I say. It's not anything other than God speaking to you this morning that is going to be able to empower you to experience His joy. So as we close this service this morning, let God teach you how to keep people in your heart. Let God teach you how to keep people in your mind. Let God teach you how to pray for those people that He's put in your life so that you can begin a journey on a pathway to experiencing God's joy. Let God speak to you as we sing this morning.
said, it's, I thank my God every time I remember you, keeping you in my thoughts. Then he said, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Then he said, and this is my prayer. Paul kept these people in his thoughts, he kept them in his mind, and he kept them in his heart, he kept them in his prayers. As you go from here this morning, would you let God continue speaking to you about the relationships that you have in your life? And if there be any relationship that does not bring glory to God, then we have to pray and ask God's grace to cover that. And maybe there's some relationships that we need to walk away from that we've hung on to over and over and over and over and over and over that is never going to allow us to experience God's joy. And then for those others, we have to remember to keep people in our hearts, people in our thoughts, and keep people in our prayers. As we go this morning, let God bring those people into your mind that you need to pray for. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for Paul's words in the beginning here of the book of Philippians. We thank you, Lord, that you have shared with each and every one of us how to experience the first steps in experiencing your joy. And God, I just pray that as we go from here this morning that you would continue speaking to every one of us about relationships that we have in our life how we need to handle those relationships and how we need to continue to pray for those people. Lord, I just ask that you would guide us, that you would direct us, and we would keep an open heart and an open mind to you and you alone. Lord, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your blessing. We give you thanks for this church and ask you be with us as we go from here this morning. We ask all of this in the mighty powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And the Lord bless you.